We're gonna jump into God's word. We're starting a new series uh, this week. We're calling All Ears. We're gonna talk about listening. I think it's really important. I, th- I think we live in a day where uh, listening skills could probably be developed a little bit in all of us, uh, me included, but I think all of us could learn how to listen a little better. It feels like we kind of, people try to talk over each other a little bit right now and um, interrupting, uh, not even just in like one-on-one dialogue, but I just think culturally, you know, now that you can post stuff and it just feels loud. And, and I don't know that we're, we're listening well. Um, and when you listen, some really good things happen. Uh, you learn a lot. Uh, you also, if you, if you listen well, uh, you grow in your affection for other people, your understanding, your empathy, just a lot of things that kind of make the world a better place. So we're going we're gonna to go into that. We're going to look at listening to each other. We're going to look at listening to ourselves, things in our own minds. And then we're going to look at listening to God, which is where, that's actually where we're going to start, is listening to God. Um, I, I heard a, a, a leadership talk a few years ago that just stuck with me, and I've referenced it many, many times over the years, uh, and it was about listening. It was a woman named Sheila Heen who wrote a book called Thanks for the Feedback, and uh, Sheila Heen is a corporate trainer, goes around to companies and businesses, teaching people how to have better conflict and how to, how to do feedback better. And so when she first started doing it, she mentioned that um, all of the coaching and training that they did was helping people get better at delivering feedback. So they taught that um, uh, feedback sandwich. You you know what I'm talking about? It's like you got got the bun, the bun, and the meat, you know what I'm saying? And it's like the first top bun is like compliments, and you're like, you're doing so awesome, and I just think you're great, and affirm you. I just want you to be affirmed today. Then the meat, it's like, but here's where you're not doing good. You know, here's what I really want to talk to you about. And then you end with like, but you're so great. Um, That sandwich used to work until they taught it. Now everybody knows it. Okay. And so like, if you've had somebody come to you and they come with a compliment, you're like, "What, what, what do you really want to talk about? Okay. Okay. Somebody comes at me with compliments. I'm like, Hey, how about we do this burger with no bun? You know what I mean, let's make it a lettuce wrap. All right, come right out. Just give it to me. Like, what do you want? What do you really want to talk about? Don't patronize me. Uh, so you're trying to soften me up to be receptive. I'm receptive. All right, come on, come on, let's have it. Um, so they they tried to train people to give it better, and what they found over time is that the success of the of the feedback was almost completely determined by the receptivity of the listener. All the power is in the hand of the listener. Like if you had somebody give you the most skilled feedback ever and you got defensive or all you could think about is, well, you're not perfect either, okay, and you put up a wall, it doesn't matter how skilled the delivery was, you don't get it. You don't get anything out of it. You can shut it down. On the other side of that, if somebody came to you with the most clunky, awkward, direct, unskilled feedback ever, and you were a skilled listener, you'd be able to sift through all of the junk and get to the golden nugget, which actually is kind of the beginning of like even your attitude toward feedback. Is this helpful? Or am I looking at this as a gift, as gold? Or am I looking at this as something I gotta be defensive against? So I just, when she said that, it really resonated with me. It made me search my own heart and shape my own attitude around the power of listening and being receptive is even more important than how well they said it is how well I can receive it and how well I can listen. We're gonna talk about listening to God today, which let's just be honest, it's confusing. It's not super clear. Sometimes church folk, you know, they, they make it over simple. You know, hey, I'm trying to, man, I just don't know what to do in this situation. What should I do? Well, have you prayed about it? Yeah, yeah, I did pray about it. What did the Lord say? <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm trying to figure that out. You know, I don't know. I've been like looking in the clouds. I didn't see anything. You know, I don't know. Well, I mean, I didn't hear an audible voice. Like, what do you mean? And let's be honest, there is a tendency to miscommunicate. Okay, my wife and I both speak the same language. We both speak English. 
I know the nuances of her face. I know what this wrinkle in her forehead, I know exactly what that means. I know exactly what that means. I know what it means when she doesn't say anything at all. I know what the pregnant pause means. I know all of that, okay? So body language is part of communication. Eyes are part of communication. All of it is part of it. And we, and we miscommunicate with each other who we're with all the time. How much more, God, who we're not necessarily looking at his eyes or his forehead or where his body language, how much are we gonna miscommunicate? There is, it is gonna happen. That, that being said, it's not hopeless, okay? We, I want us to take an approach to hearing from God that sits in the tension of the fact that this is a mystical thing, that this is a supernatural thing, but at the same time, there is logic to it. And we can sort of understand the parts of it a little bit better that will help us to become more receptive. And so this message, I'm just gonna tell you, this is not a rah-rah message, this is not a fire you up message, get one for the Gipper message. This is really, really, really practical. And we're gonna, so we're gonna start uh, this conversation today. Um, I, I was recently uh, in Washington, D.C. Shayla and I were there a couple weeks ago. We spent some time with actually uh, some friends of ours. Uh, part of, we, we helped work on this church planning thing together. A guy by the name of Mark Batterson. Uh, he and his wife, Laura, are friends of Shayla and I. We were there. We spent some time together. And Mark wrote, he's written several books, but he wrote a book called Whisper. And the book Whisper, the entire book is about listening to God, the languages of God. And um, actually, Mark and I shot, like, I, I, I just did like a 20-minute Q&A with him. We made a video. I'm going to put it online this week. I hope it'll be a good resource and help you. Uh, but be looking for that if you like this topic. Uh, if you are interested in how do I discern the voice of God better, I would encourage you to get his book, Whisper. Uh, I, I listened to it. All right, I do a lot of audio, audio books. Uh, I listen to it, and I just want to be upfront and clear because I know we've got some cynical uh, folks that come to 11.30, not 10 o'clock. 11.30, there are a few cynical folks. I feel like I need to say this. Um, there is no G Ford promo code, okay? I get no kickback from the book. It's, it's, I get nothing other than the satisfaction that I help somebody. I read the book. It really helped me. I can highly recommend it to you. The book is called Whisper. Uh, in the book, he outlines seven things uh, that are ways that God speaks. And today, we're not going to talk about all seven, but we're going to talk about one and how it affects the other six. Uh, the first one is scripture. God speaks through scripture. Uh, the next one is desires which can be tricky, because you're like, well, this desire I have, is this me? Is this my flesh, or is this a God-given desire? He talks about that in the book. Doors, which is another one, okay? Door opens, God, is this your will? Okay, because an open door could be an opportunity, but it could be a distraction, or it could be a temptation. So what about doors? But God does use doors. And dreams, oh man, that's a tricky one. If you ever had a dream, you wake up, you're like, but what could it mean? You know, you wake up, you're like, I don't know, man. Like, there was this like river running through my house, you know, and then I did this, and I don't know, man. It's like, you know, this, uh, there, there was like a dog talking, you know, I don't know. <laughs> people is the next one, that's a big one. God uses people, but how do I discern? Uh, promptings. And. The last one is pain. I, I want to I start, and this is where, where we're going to spend our time today, is, is looking uh, at the scripture. Um, I think it's really important the, the way that we frame our relationship to the Bible. The Bible's big. It's 66 books written by various authors, lots of different contexts, written over thousands of years. It can be a bit overwhelming. And sometimes as, as, a, as a Christian or a follower of Jesus, you're like, you know, I don't want to be ignorant. So we, we kind of take this academic approach to the Bible, which is in a sense appropriate because I want to learn as, as much as I can from an academic standpoint. But the Bible is not a textbook alone. It is actually also a text message. It's a communication tool that God uses. It, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. That in real time, in 2022, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong in my life, or I'm trying to find out what is true, that the, the Bible inspired by God is useful or relevant to help me do that in real time. 
It corrects us when we're wrong. Hey, I know you're a grown up. I know you're mature. I know you don't want anybody sunning you. uh, But there are times that we all need correction. Come on, let's be humble enough to admit that. We need correction, all of us, all of us. Grandma, grandpa need correction. Mom and dad, need, everybody needs correction. And sometimes you may struggle to receive it from other people, but what if you were in your Bible, you came across something, the Holy Spirit illuminated, and it brought to your attention, not for the purpose of shame, but for the purpose of correction. And you walk away going, the Lord spoke to me today, I gotta make this change. And so, so 2 Timothy 3 says the Bible will correct us. It teaches us what is right. And then look at this, verse 17 says God uses it. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God uses the Bible to speak to you about the work that he has for you to do. Hebrews 4.12 says this, the word of God is alive and active. It's not just a textbook, it's a text message. It's not just a classroom, it's a conversation. He said it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates into our dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And look at this, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. As you're in God's word and you're calibrating to his heart, your, your, your attitudes can be exposed. Oh, my attitude needs to change. My attitude, my heart needs to change. And, and so, so this is what the Bible does for us. God uses the Bible in that way in conversation. Um, There's a rabbinic tradition that says every word of the Bible has 70 faces and 600,000 meanings. Okay. Don't take that literally. It's, it's hyperbolic. Okay. It's not, it's not literally 70. Every one of them has 70, but the concept being this, that the, the scripture has a way of God speaking very specifically through it, and it doesn't just say the exact thing that, you know, to everybody every season. Like, for example, you may be reading a scripture today, and God will speak something to you based on where you're at in life, based on how mature you are, based on what information you could even accept today, and and might be situational. 10 years from now, you read the same scripture And the Lord brings a dimension to it in your mind that you didn't see 10 years ago. This is why we never, ever, ever, ever develop a been there, done that attitude about the Bible. Check box, did that, okay, yep, I know that one. I know that, no, you come back to it with an open heart and let the Holy Spirit illuminate something because you might be ready for something you couldn't have seen five years ago. You've lived, you've lived five years, man. You've been through some stuff, man. You've walked through, you're a different human, and so God's speaking the same word to a different person. You're not the same person you were. And and so so you you gotta be open to that. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, I I shared this uh, technique called Lexio Divina. I did this a couple years ago, but some things are worth bringing back up. I wanna bring this back up to you. This is a process that if you'll apply this consistently, uh, it opens up a conversation with God, it gives God an opportunity to get a word in edgewise or to illuminate some things in your mind and heart. So it's five questions as you're reading through the scripture that will help this become conversational. The first is, starts with this, what does the text, what does the text say? What does the text say? Who's writing this book and who are they writing it to? And what's, what, what, what is the context? This is really important. This is why I would encourage you. There's nothing wrong with getting verse of the day, you know, Bible app or whatever you're on, and it throws you a verse of the day, okay? Isaiah such and such, Psalm this, Ecclesiastes that. That's great. But if you don't really understand the context, you could grab a verse and think it means something it doesn't mean if you knew the whole context. For example, if I just showed up in your life tomorrow at 3 p.m. and I listened to three sentences of your day, at 3 p.m. tomorrow, I might draw a conclusion about what you said and what you meant and who you are and what that means for me, that you would say, well, you didn't hear what I said this morning. No, you don't understand this conversation we were having. This was our eighth conversation. It's not our first one. We, we've been talking about this eight times, so I'm talking different than it is, but I might draw all kinds of conclusions not knowing context. You ever walk in, somebody in your family's watching a show, they're watching something, it means very little to you, 
where you're just taking, you don't know the characters. You don't know what happened last season. You don't know. So I would encourage you to develop a, a systematic plan of studying the Bible. For example, read through James. And don't just plunge into James 1. Go figure out who in the world is James. And who's he writing to? And what's going on? And don't just jump in to James 3, because James 1 and 2 has something to say about James 3. You'd, look, you'd read James 3 differently knowing what was said in the first two chapters. So to make space in your life for a systematic approach, because I'm going to tell you, I think some of the really warped thinking comes from people who isolate a scripture really knowing not much. And so they know just enough to be dangerous, just enough to yell it at folks, and become jerks for Jesus. <laughs> Ever met one of those? You're like, I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's what he meant by that. <laughs> so you, you, you don't want to fall into that. You don't want to fall into that. And, and, and this is how we keep ourselves safeguarded from just falling into our presuppositions or our confirmation bias is we, we study it first. We study, we have to know the context. So what does the text say? The second is what does the text say? What does the text say to me? Okay. So now that I know it in its proper context, what, what is this? What is it saying to me? Let it talk to you. First is reading, the second is meditating. A little side note, but I hope this message is just nothing but encouraging. So I don't want to, I'm not trying to discourage you, but I want to caution you from creating aggressive, quantitative reading goals. Bible reading goals. I'm going to read through the, I'm going to read through the Bible before June. I'm going to read, I'm going to get there. I'm going to come, come hell or high water. I'm going to read 17 chapters a day and I will get through the, it's like, bro, no, calm down. It's 66, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And if you read it like that, to just get to the finish line as fast as you can, you're, you might miss the chance to slow down enough to have it read you. S slow down. You, you might spend a minute reading and you might spend an hour listening. And you might, by the end of that hour, just begin the listening process because I've started to listen. God, what are you saying to me? And God may open a conversation with you that doesn't open and shut in the same day. And, and, and I'm telling you, this is the deep learning. Deep, deep learning. Because this is going from just academic to transformational renewing of the mind. God's speaking. This is divine. Listen, let's not reverse engineer it and, 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 and take it apart so much that we miss the divine nature of it. We gotta sit in that tension. Understanding the logic, but at the same time, letting God do a supernatural work. So what does the text say to me that's meditating on it? The third is, is, is praying through the text, which is, is, is um, what do I want to say to God? What do I want to say to God? So this, is, this is prayer. So I read it in its proper context. I thought about what was speaking to me. And now I pray something. God, I got something to say to you now. And then after that, this is the fourth, which is contemplation, which is what does God want to say to me? Let him talk back to you. And then the fifth is action, which is what should I do? What do I do now? So we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. So here's, here, here's an aiming point. I think every good message, I think every good scripture, I think every good Lexio Divina, every time with the Lord will lead you to changing the way you think or changing the way you act or both. And sometimes the Lord may just start with how you think. I want you to begin thinking differently. And sometimes it may be a brand new thought. I've never thought like this before. I'm gonna start thinking this way. But sometimes God uses it to recalibrate you to something you already know, but you veered away from. The current of life's pulled you away. You know better. And sometimes through the word and through contemplating and meditating and praying and reading and all of this, the Lord's like, remember that? And you're like, oh. 
By his rod and his staff, he pulls you back in line and you get right back to, to, to realigning yourself with God's word and God's values and God's truth. But sometimes it's a brand new thought. And sometimes connected to those thoughts and beliefs are now new behaviors. What do I do? Hey, don't read so fast. Okay, the, you read the coffee cup verse, take a sip. Cool, all right, let's go, check box. I'm going to work. No, no, no. Take the time to wrestle it all the way to the ground. What do I need to reshape my thinking? What do I need to change in my doing? I, I want to show you, uh, this is something from just, this is my, from my personal time with the Lord, how God used this in a specific way in my life. So I'm going to take you through Alexio Divina I, I actually did a while ago, okay? Um, to set this up, the what does the text say, I'll tell you about another resource, the Bible Project. If you go to YouTube, it's this new website, it's called YouTube, they got lots of videos. You go on there, lots of them are worthless, but there are some that are really good. And, and there's this thing called the Bible Project. They take every single book of the Bible and they give you a summary and an outline and they do drawings and pictures. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible. If you're not using this resource, you're missing out. I beg you, as you're reading the Bible, go and use this. Go to these, uh, go, go, go watch these videos. One I'm going to share with you is from the book of Colossians. Colossians. I'm going to show you one minute. Okay, it's a nine minute video, but I'm going to show you in one minute. Okay, so if you don't know anything about Colossians, you're about to learn a bunch in one minute. One minute. Check this out. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. Incredible resource. That's a nine-minute video. You saw one minute of it. If you kept watching, you would know enough about Colossians to begin digging in and, and kind of working on that first one. Uh, what does the text say? Every book, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Daniel, oh, what a resource. Please, please, I beg of you, use it, all right? Um, Colossians. So I go, I'm gonna study Colossians in my own time. Let the Lord work in my heart. Ask the Lord to speak to me. So I go to Colossians. One of the things that I noticed in my study of Colossians before I started reading Colossians is that Paul wrote this letter to people he didn't know. He had never met them before, which just reading the context of the book in, it quickened my heart because it's something I've been struggling with. Okay, I grew up in a church. It was a small church. Everybody knew everybody. The pastor knew everybody. The pastor was meeting everybody's needs, running around, doing this, doing that, doing the other thing. And our church, the, it's different context. Our church has grown. We have four services. We have a lot of people. So I am now, uh, we have people online, people literally all over the country uh, who are giving me the uh, opportunity and the responsibility to be their pastor, but I don't know them. So I'm in the weird position that I'm pastoring and leading people I, I don't know and I haven't met and I can't keep up with it and I can't meet everybody. So I've been in this feeling of angst, like I've been struggling because I'm like, man, what, how do I do this well? Because I don't want to be the limit on the church where I go try to run around and, you know, I'm not, human beings are not scalable. So if I run around, try to do everything and know everybody and meet everybody's need and be there and do all the teaching and all the counseling and all the this and all the, if I do that, you burn yourself out. You can't do it. Uh, so you got to delegate and train and raise up infrastructure and do all this stuff, which is tough. But then it's weird as a pastor because you're like, but man, I, 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 I want to do this right. I want to serve people. I want to have the right heart. You know what I mean? I didn't, go to, I didn't go to Bible school to be a CEO. I went there to be a pastor. And how do I do this right? So I've been, I've been wrestling with this. And I come across Colossians. Paul's writing this letter. To, he's pastoring people who he doesn't know. 
I'm all ears. I'm all ears. I'm like, Lord, what are you going to say? Now I get, my heart starts doing this because I'm like, God's about to speak to me. So now I open up Colossians 1. I start reading verse 3. says, um, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, if you didn't know context and you just read that, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God and you didn't know he's writing this to people he knows of, but he doesn't actually know, it wouldn't mean the same thing to you. Just knowing that little fact opens your mind up in a different way. So I started thinking about that. So here's what now, what does the text say to me? And what does God want to say to me in all this? Now the question comes in my mind, Greg, how much are you praying for these people you don't know? Are you even really praying for them? I had to think about that. I'm like, you know, I really don't. I was praying, I, I pray for my wife and I pray for my kids and I pray for my family and I pray for our staff and I pray for my friends who are going through a hard time. Uh, and when somebody tells me about their problem I, and I say, I'm gonna pray for you, I actually do. It's not a placeholder. I'm like praying for you, bro. No, if I tell you I'm praying for you, I'm going to pray for you. But what about these people in other places who I've never even seen, I'll probably never come in contact with, am I praying for them? So the fact that Paul was praying for people he didn't know spoke to me. The text spoke to me. So he says, I, I, I pray for you and I give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we've heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all of God's people. Paul was encouraged and inspired by the stories and by the testimonies of what God was doing through people he didn't even know. God's speaking to me through that text. Verse six, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. Now think about this. Paul's writing this in a time where proliferating the gospel came through very slow means. It was happening on foot. It was happening on ship. It was happening riding a camel. It was, it was a slow thing. And yet he was, it was the beginning of the fulfillment of Acts 1.8, that the, you'll receive power, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You'll go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so Paul is just beginning to, to experience this and to taste this. And so I thought about what that must have been like for him to take something that was so concentrated in Jerusalem and to seeing it go into the ends of the earth. And, and he said, we asked God, oh, oh, let me back up. So, so, he, so he, he, I'm thinking about Paul doing that, but then I'm thinking about the joy. I'm thinking, you know, take, don't, don't get so frustrated at the fact that this is so out of your control that you don't take joy in the fact that the gospel is proliferating, that it's going places and doing things that you can't see. And then he says this uh, in, in the next part. He said, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. I'd read that in other seasons and I didn't hear what I heard this time, which was it. We ask God, we ask God to give you complete knowledge. We ask God to give you complete knowledge. We, we ask God to do what God does for you instead of us trying to do God's job for you. We do our job, God does. He goes, and we ask God, 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 would you give complete knowledge? Would you give wisdom and understanding? Okay, what am I gonna pray for these people who I don't even know? I'm talking to somebody right now who I don't know, but is listening right now. What would I pray for that person? Would I pray, God, God, would you, you? It's, it's not about me. God starts speaking to me going, hey, Greg, I was doing pretty good before you got here. I'll do just fine after you're gone. We're gonna partner together for a season, but don't get it twisted of what's yours to do and what's mine to do. So I pray, Lord, would you give them wisdom and not God, would you lead them according to your word? God, when they're in your word, would you speak through your, God, would you talk to them? Lord, Lord, would you give them what they need when they need it, Lord? And so Paul is praying this prayer incessantly for these people, asking God, asking God. And what's he doing? As he's asking God to do this, he's also calibrating his own mind and heart to know what's his role and what's not. Okay, and so, so then he says, um, uh, you know, we... I'm sorry, verse six, the same news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it, I already read that. Verse, uh, okay, we'll go to chapter two. This next thing hit me, chapter two, verse one through four, he said, I want you to know how much I've agonized for you. That word agonized, last time I read it, jumped off the page. Like he, he's agonizing for people he doesn't know. God began to speak to me through, 
through the process of praying for people you don't know and for celebrating the fruit that you don't taste and trusting that there's things happening that you don't see and that you didn't do. Now, Greg, your job is to plant the seed. Someone else may water it, and, but it's God that's gonna bring the increase. Keep straight on your role. Pray for these folks. As he's doing that, his heart is being connected to them in a way that's beyond just someone's a, a, a number or it's a stat or a statistic because you don't agonize for a number, you agonize for a person. And he goes and he, he reads all the way through. Uh, he says, um, I've agonized for you and for the church in Laodicea, for many other believers who have never met me personally. Verse two, he says, I, I want them to be encouraged and knit together with strong ties of love. Can, can you feel his heart? He, he's, he cares about these people. God's given him an affection, a soft heart for these people. He said, I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. It's about Christ himself. Point to Jesus, not yourself. Verse three, he says, in him lie all hidden treasures and wisdom and knowledge that it's, it, it's Jesus who sets people free. He said, I'm telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Verse five, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you're living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. The words agonize and rejoice jumped out to me. So in my reading through this, asking the Lord to speak to me, what does the text say? The context alone caused me to look at the text differently. The specific things that Paul said, although written thousands of years ago, had direct application to me. God and I get into a conversation of prayer and contemplation. And then from there, now I've got some action steps. You know, I need to set up a discipline in my prayer time where I'm not just have this prayer list of people I know. I gotta begin praying for these people I don't know. I gotta reframe when I start feeling this visceral feeling about this, I gotta put the word on it and I gotta put the truth on it and I gotta recalibrate to this so that, so that I don't just get sucked into the feeling. I, I, I've got, okay, this is how I'm gonna keep my emotions where they need to be. This is how I'm gonna remain healthy. And so now a plan starts to emerge in a conversation with God. And this is the thing by not just reading the scripture, but by having conversation, listening to God as I read the scripture, now all these other things start to run through this. Is this my desire or God's? Well, imagine if you keep allowing the Holy Spirit to illuminate attitudes and thoughts and correct you when you're wrong and show you what's right and prepare you for the good work, you'll start to know when a door opens if that's a good work or if it's a distraction or if it's a temptation. The desire, you'll start to know the difference between your flesh and your spirit. The dream, you'll know the difference between that was just some crazy thing I've been thinking about and it somehow showed up in the REM cycle versus this is, no, I think this is something that God is, is, is showing me. You, you'll start to notice these differences, how it all runs through the, the filter of scripture. But the filter of scripture is more than academic, it's conversational. You know, it says in um, Psalm 37, four, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in the Lord. Hey, if you just pull that on Monday because it's a scripture of the day, delight in the Lord, you're like, oh, cool. Yeah, delight in the Lord. And then the Porsche show up at my house. Delight in the Lord. And God sends some, some godly man with abs and money. Lord, does you know the, Lord, you know my heart's desire, Lord. Now, okay, uh, you, you, you gotta be careful because what did the text actually say? What happens is when I delight in the Lord, how do I delight in the Lord? I'm conversing with the Lord. I'm in co conversation. I'm in relationship with God. And so now I'm hearing from him. His word is speaking. We're going back and forth in his word. And so guess what's happening? My heart is being connected to his. My values are aligned to his. His will becomes mine. And now the desires of my heart are in alignment with him. If you will have conversation with God, let him speak to you through his living and active word. Some of the desires you have now will wane. You won't even want that anymore. Some of the doors you've been praying for, you'll stop praying for because you realize, you know, that's not the right door for me. How does that happen? Through the com conversation, conversation with God, aligning his heart to yours. So the desires of your heart when they're his desires, they will come to fruition, come to fruition. So let's do this right now. Let's just take a moment, let's reflect, let's quiet our hearts. And I want you to begin thinking about 
and maybe even jotting down in this moment, something God wants you to think or do or both differently. And for you, maybe it's something as practical as evaluating your quantity and quality time in God's word. Maybe there's some of you that said an ambitious plan, I'm gonna read through the Bible by the end of the year. And and you're like, you know what? I'm actually gonna slow it down. I'm gonna take more time to listen. Uh, Maybe for some of you, it's actually, you go, you know, honestly, I don't have any discipline around this at all. I'm not really doing this at all. And now you're gonna start finding time in your life to do this. I need to build this in. Um, Or maybe uh, for somebody else, there's an an issue of attitude. Maybe God's been saying the same thing to you and you know what God's saying to you. You know what God's saying to you. You know what God's word says to you, but you keep rejecting it. You keep rejecting it and you're hoping for a different answer, but the answer is the answer whether you like it or not. And God's speaking it to you. And, And maybe God's saying to you today, hey, I wanna come in and deal with your attitude and I want you to be receptive and I want you to trust me with the thing you don't wanna trust me with. I'm asking you to take that step of faith. Whatever God is speaking to you, let's quiet our hearts and minds right now and be receptive. invite you to stand on your feet and our prayer team is going to come forward at this time. We're going to end in a song. And as we, uh, as we play this song, as we sing this song, if you would like someone to pray with you about anything specific, uh, feel free to come forward. If you're watching online, we have a prayer team dedicated to serving you as well. You can go to whatever platform you're on, send a a direct message or right on the wall there. Uh, You can put a prayer request on our team will serve you as well. But let's not move on too quickly before we give God a chance to speak directly to us. Let's worship together.